it took just one man to save England from a revolution more bloody than that of France towards the end of the 18th century. He's now the hero for over 50 million people. He was born one of 19 children in a very poor home where his father was a minister but not a very practical man, though very earnest. His mother may have been the most beautiful woman in England, almost certainly the smartest. She knew several languages. She could debate theology with any minister and win. And yet the parents of this man, this boy, didn't understand the Christian gospel. About eight children died. The rest were told over and over again, if you want to get to heaven, you must keep the Ten Commandments. And John Wesley never learnt any better when he went to Charterhouse School and then to university, when he joined the Holy Club, when he read the famous books of the day, Thomas a Kempis, The Imitation of Christ, Jeremy Taylor, Holy Living, Holy Dying, William Law, about the serious life of a Christian. I own the books and have read in them. But Wesley never found the gospel in them because they emphasised, like his parents, the law, the law, the law. Do, 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 cock-a-doodle-do. Wesley was a terrible failure for 13 years. He was ordained, became his father's curate. People didn't like his preaching. Ultimately, he went with his brother to Georgia in America, where many criminals were sent. And here he was a failure. He didn't stress the love of God. He didn't stress the peace that comes from believing in the love of God. He taught the law, the law, the law, do, 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 cock a doodle do, and the people hated him. Finally, they took him to court, and he fled to Charlestown, and then by boat to England with his tail between his legs. A miserable failure. This man who had degrees from Oxford, who'd had wonderful parents, whose whole heart wanted to do what was right, but he did not know the gospel. On his way to Georgia, there was a great storm. And at one point, a huge wave fell on the tiny ship and it looked as though the ship would go down. But there was a company of Moravians on board and they sang. They sang hymns. And when the storm was over, Wesley asked them, aren't you afraid of death? And they said, no, we're not afraid of death. When Wesley got to England, he sought out a Moravian who was there by the name of Peter Bowler. And Peter Bowler taught him three things. That Christ, by his atonement, had redeemed everybody in the world and that salvation was for the taking, not from doing, doing, doing. He taught him the simplicity of faith, that faith was not a struggle. Faith was an empty hand to receive the gift. And thirdly, he taught him that when a man really understands Calvary and accepts that it was done for him, then his whole heart and mind will be flooded with assurance, as John says in his first epistle and the fifth chapter, these things are written that you might know that you have eternal life. And Romans 8 says the Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are the children of God. 
So Bola taught him salvation's free. And faith is not a struggle, it's just a taking. What a revelation to Wesley. Now for 60 years almost, he will preach that Christ is our representative, died for the whole world and redeemed the whole world, that all are saved legally. And that now all we need to do is accept the gift. He would teach ever afterwards that God and heaven are given away. Only God and heaven can be had for the asking. He would teach that when we accepted the forgiveness for our sins, then the Holy Spirit would flood the life with love and gratitude so that obedience would be a pleasure. Religion would not be a drudgery, a boredom a burden. It would be a revelry. It would be a festival. It would be an everlasting song. Well, Wesley was wrestling with these new truths after his failure in America and he was invited to go to Aldersgate Street where Luther was to be read. And that morning he read the words you are not far from the kingdom of God. Well, he went. And the Luther from Romans was read. And Wesley later wrote, My heart was strangely warmed, and the assurance was given me that God had taken away my sins, even mine, and delivered me from the law of sin and death. And he went forth to change England. He became the most well-known man on the roads of England, Scotland and Ireland. And he did what no other man had ever done. He turned the horse's saddle, the English sky above and the surrounding air into a study. He threw the reins on the horse's neck and held the book up to his eyes. And for 50 or 60 miles, he read and learned what a man was this Wesley. There was a radiance that flowed from him. There was a perpetual happiness. He had a patience that was infinite. He had a kindness that was without limit. He loved people. He looked upon every soul as of immortal value and worth. Dr. Samuel Johnson, the great lexicographer, said that dog, John Wesley, he enchants you with his conversation, then he suddenly leaves you, go and talk to some old woman. Yes, Wesley regarded that as a duty and the woman as important to God as Samuel Johnson. He was a tremendous scholar and he prepared 371 books and pamphlets for his people because he had 80,000 followers when he died just in England and scores of thousands in America. He loved the poor. He lived on 28 pounds a year and every cent over that he gave to the poor. He prepared dispensaries so the poor who were sick could get medical help for free. He even had an employment agency where poor people who couldn't find work could get it through Wesley who would arrange something for them. What a man was Wesley. He said, 10,000 cares are no more weight to my mind than 10,000 hairs on my head. He said, I've not known what it is to be depressed for more than 15 minutes at a time. And if depression did come, he healed it by work. He was a tremendous worker. The scale of his work, the intensity of his work, the influence of his work, he preached more sermons, wrote more letters, built more churches 
waged more controversies, influenced more people than anyone else in England. But Wesley was human, and all humans make mistakes. Christians make mistakes. Sometimes God permits it so that other Christians may learn something. Wesley thought all women were like his mother, who was a saint. He was so wrong. Every time he got sick or had an accident, he was close to falling in love with the woman that nursed him. And one day he did propose to such a woman, a widow with children, who outwardly was very Christian, but inwardly was a terrible, terrible woman. Within an hour, of, within a month of the marriage, this woman had nothing to talk about except the faults of her great husband. She became a gadfly, always discontented, always finding fault. She was a torment to Wesley for 30 years, but she never clouded his cheerfulness and he never budged a hair's breadth from his program of saving England. One time when she left him, he wrote, I did not send her away. I will not recall her. But he wrote to her and he said, if you had a thousand years, you couldn't remedy the damage you have caused. Until you do your best, I bid you farewell. Wesley transformed England. England of that time was soul extinct and stomach well alive. Profanity filled the air. The king roared with profanity ceaselessly. Judges at the bench swore at people on trial. Chaplains preaching swore at people to listen more carefully. On one occasion, a duchess visited a lawyer, and after she left, the lawyer said, I really don't know her name, but she must have been someone of very high estate because she swore dreadfully. It was a cruel age. Temple Bar had a Fresno of human heads. It was the age of the pillory. It was the age of the gin hill. It was the age of the debtor's prison. It was an age when women were whipped publicly and burnt at the stake. That law was not wiped out till 1794. It was a world where religion was dead, where violence abounded. Wesley lived dangerously, stoned, hit, menaced, until the country came to revere him and to respect him. It was Wesley who changed, saved England from a revolution like that of France. His brother Charles was converted about the same time as he was and wrote 6,500 hymns. Jesus, lover of my soul, is the best known of them. Charles too was a wonderful man and he, like Wesley, would go to the jails to preach because the churches shut their doors against the Wesleys. Once they preached once, they were never allowed back. So they went to the jails. Charles says on one occasion he preached to 52 felons awaiting execution and among them was a child of 10. They also preached in the fields and were listened to by thousands. They had a friend, George Whitfield, who was a better preacher than Wesley, but not a better scholar, not a better thinker, and he became a Calvinist. He became a believer in predestination, and he couldn't stop badgering Wesley about predestination. So finally, Wesley wrote a sermon called Free Grace, it's found still 
among the Wesley sermons. And he said, you predestinarians make God worse than the devil, more false, more cruel, more unjust. He said to this effect, fancy God ordaining that most of the people he made would have a life of sin and sorrow, trouble and anxiety, and then would be tormented for eternity. What a teaching, said Wesley. Why does the Bible give us praise and condemnation for its characters? Obviously, human beings are responsible. Obviously, God has given free will to human beings. That explains the tragedy of the universe. God took a fearful risk when he made free will beings, but he thought it was worth the risk. And most of us think also that it was worth the risk. And so Wesley and Whitfield parted company. And Whitfield, who sometimes preached for 40 hours in a week, was worn out by the age of 50, died in an asthmatic attack on the stairs as he was speaking to people. A wonderfully great man, perhaps the best preacher England ever had, but not as intelligent as Wesley. Wesley had shown that freedom of the will was the reason the Bible could praise some people and condemn others. We are responsible for what we do. If a man only does goodness because he's compelled to do it, then it's not goodness at all. And if a man does evil because he's compelled to do it, the Calvinistic view, then it's not evil at all. No human beings are responsible. And we are responsible to respond to the love of God who loves the unlovely, who accepts the unacceptable, who died for every one of us not only died for us, he redeemed us. When a representative does something, all whom he represents are counted as having done it. So when Christ died for all, as Romans 5 says, while we were yet sinners, we were reconciled. So before we heard the gospel, before we made a decision for God, we'd already been saved, but it must be accepted read Romans 5 often while we were without strength Christ died for us while we were yet sinners we were reconciled to God and at the close of the chapter it tells us that by the righteousness of one Jesus all the world has been acquitted declared righteous but it must be accepted so that grace may reign through righteousness do you understand that word grace? It was a big word for Wesley. It meant the unceasing, undeserved love of God for the undeserving, for the ugly, for the failures, for sinners. That's grace. And so Wesley lived until he was 88 years of age. Even at 85, he could walk 12 miles in a single day. But at 86 he said, I am decayed from head to foot. My right hand trembles. My mouth is dry and hot. A fever is surrounding me. Then he took a five months tour when he was like that throughout Scotland and England. And he came back to die. And as he was dying he said, Little children, let us love one another. Into the holiest, only by the blood of Jesus. The best of all is that God is for us. And he fell asleep in Christ. God bless you.